Um, but we're going to crack on now with John Baker, who's very much is here. John, I'm just going to get your uh, slides up and I shall offer you the floor and you can introduce yourself. Off you go. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to um, talk to you today. Um, while Tom's getting the slides up, my name is John Baker. I'm the Chief Executive of the Whitehaven Harbour Commissioners. Um, I started there in January, um, having run the Grand National at Aintree Race Course um, for seven years previously. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, the harbour, Whitehaven Harbour, its importance to the community and the town. Um, and I'm also going to talk particularly about the Rum Story um, Tourist Attraction Museum. Um, and talk about some of the things, the initiatives that we've been doing since we were able to reopen uh, in June of this year. Uh, and the Harbour Commissioners um, don't just do the Harbour and the Rum story, they do lots of other things as well, which again, um, I will touch on. Um, so the first slide there, um, a great picture of the Harbour itself. Um, the Harbour Commissioners um, have been around, as you can see, the Harbour community since 1634. So um, nearly 400 years of history. Um, for us to live up to um, and the commissioners have obviously been part of Whitehaven's past, its present and hopefully for another 400 years uh, in the future. Um, at various points in time, um, Whitehaven Harbour was probably one of the leading three ports um, in the country, um, probably um, 18th, 19th century uh, in particular. Um, so as I say, it's got an important part um, to play in the town. Um, we're a not-for-profit organisation, um, we don't have any shareholders, um, any revenue that we can generate goes back into, into our business. Um, we employ a total of 12 people who are all uh, local people, excepting myself, uh, and we have a board of eight commissioners um, who are all voluntary uh, and who all have the interests of Whitehaven um, at their heart and at their interest. And the harbour is a trust port. Um, it's run by a local statutory body, which is ourselves, um, the Harbour Commission Commissioners, and our overall aim is the betterment of the harbour um, and its environs um, for the town and for its community. Um, so as I say, there's a picture of the harbour. If we go on to the next slide, please, Tom. Um, some other bits and pieces that we do, there's obviously a marina at Whitehaven as well. Um, we do own the marina, but we actually uh, rent that out to a company called Whitehaven Marina Leisure Limited. Um, there's 400 berths there um, for a mixture of a leisure and business. Um, and in a pandemic year, it was a, a bit strange, really. We had our best ever occupancy, which was at 88%. Um, so the marina is doing particularly well at the moment. Uh, fishing has been a key and integral part of Whitehaven Harbour for many, many years. Um, obviously, as probably are people aware, the fishing industry is struggling um, of late and it's important that we maintain fishing uh, and the fishing industry at Whitehaven. Um, we work very closely with the cooperative, a fishing cooperative at Whitehaven um, to try and enable us to do that. At the moment, there are around a dozen local um, fishermen who are regularly fishing uh, out of Whitehaven. We obviously have some guest um, boats in from time to time as well. Um, but as I say, it's very much part of our ethos to maintain fishing as an industry in Whitehaven. And rather bizarrely, um, we also own a number of car parks across the town. There's a fantastic picture of the multi-storey there, um, which you know, I make no, no bones in saying it's a, it's a horrible building. It's a 60s building, which really doesn't look great. Um, it, takes a, it costs a lot of money to maintain it. Um, that is basically propped up really by money from the NDA and Sellerfield. Um, who lease uh, a number of floors within the multi-storey. Um, we also own four other car parks across the town. Um, and from our business perspective, it actually does help prop us up and does help us uh, continue to maintain the harbour and run the rum story, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, Tom, thanks. Next slide. Um, what we're trying to do with the harbour um, is try and make it a gold standard experience for everyone. Um, it has fallen, we had, and again, we have to accept this, it had fallen into a little bit of disrepair, um, wasn't really fantastically well looked after, and there's lots of different reasons around that. Um, but especially, again, through the pandemic, with so many more people using the harbour um, for their own health and for their exercise, um, we realise it's important that we make sure that when people do come down to the harbour, they have an enjoyable top-class experience because it's very reflective um, of what the town does. 
here is just a selection of photos of what we tried to do this year to try and enhance some things. So even little things like varnishing benches, and you can see the crow's nest in the middle at the top there. We refurbished that and cleaned all of that. Uh, we introduced some hanging baskets just for some colour and some floral displays. Introduced more dog bins this year with bags. We've done lots of painting around the place. As you can see, we're joined in partnership with the Rotary Club, who again have been great in terms of doing some planting, um, varnishing railings, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We've got a really good partnership with them. So very much this year, we've tried to put a different benchmark in and um, that's not bog standard, but it is a gold standard experience. The, the challenges we've got with that is that um, even for a bog standard experience, it costs us just to clean and maintain the harbour £315,000 a year. Uh, and again, just to give you an idea, in terms of revenue generated currently, we generate £235,000 um, of revenue from, from the harbour. And so as you can see, there's around an 80 grand uh, shortfall there, which again, we're looking at, we're propped up by the car park. But again, we need to get that harbour making more and more money so we can invest more and more into making it that gold standard experience. And because, as I say, and particularly through the pandemic, and with the feedback from some of these projects that we've done, it is clearly hugely important to, to people across the town, for visitors who come to see the coast, um, the harbour just needs to be that gold standard. Uh, thanks, Tom. Next slide, please. Uh, one project that we've, we felt was very important to address, um, again, was the lighthouses, which are real beacons um, of Whitehaven uh, and, of course, of the harbour. Um, can be seen many, many miles out to sea. Um, again, they'd fallen into disrepair. Some of these are actually, you've got the north on the, on the left there and the west pier on the right. These aren't actually bad pictures. They actually look worse than this. As you can see, uh, 1841, the North Pier was completed. 1839, um, the West Pier. Um, the full into disrepair, again, with the influx of tourism and tourists visiting Whitehaven, wanting to give the town and the community that sense of pride, we needed to do something about the lighthouses. And um, how we've done that is we've gone out to potential funders, um, the main one being for the lighthouses Sellerfield, um, but we've also engaged with lots of local businesses around providing labour for us, materials, etc. Um, and so we've managed to get the project um, up and running. If you go to the next slide, Tom, uh, you can see some of the examples of the work that's been undertaken. This is an ongoing project. We started at the end of August. I mean, even with some of these pictures, you can see, you know, just the quality and the standard of work that was put into these lighthouses originally back in that 19th century. And just in the middle there, you can just see where um, we've done some painting and you can see a sneak preview there of just how much of a difference, even just the basics of stripping back the stonework uh, and repainting has made to those lighthouses. This is a project that's going to be just short of £150,000 to complete. Um, we very much hope to unveil at the beginning of next year, probably January 2022. We've had some challenges with the weather. Ideally, we'd have started at the start of the summer rather than the end. Um, but we do think this will make a massive difference, a significant difference to um, Whitehaven and the tourism industry. Our challenge then, of course, as I've already touched on, is that once we've got it up to that standard, we need to make sure that we maintain that standard and, again, don't fall back into uh, where we ended up in, in, in the last year or so. Uh, OK, thanks, Tom. Uh, our next project, again, we've had to go out to funders to uh, enable this project to happen. Um, this is a building that's uh, called the Edge because it's on the edge of the water, as you can see. Um, for those of you who know the harbour, um, it's just further up from the beacon going towards that West Pier lighthouse. Um, Thomas Armstrong won the contract for this and they started work earlier this month. So they're on site now uh, and it's a 12 month design and build. So it'll be completed uh, this time next year. Um, it's a four and a half million pound project, as I say, part funded by Sellerfield, part funded by the Coastal Communities Fund. And as you can see, the design has attracted some, uh, some very positive comments and some quite negative comments too. It's a bit of a Marmite thing at the moment. You either seem to love it or loathe it. Uh, what isn't in doubt is that it will make a significant difference to the landscape. What's more significant is what's going to go, in it, go on inside the edge. Um, so we're going to have 17 ensuite bedrooms. Uh, there's going to be a cafe there and there's going to be toilets uh, which will be open to the public during opening hours which again is a huge challenge for, for Whitehaven at the moment. They will have showering facilities. Uh, it will also have community space so we want to invite people to come in 
um, whether it's art exhibitions, whether it's dance performance, whether it's theatre, whether it's music, whatever it may be, there will be space uh, in the edge to do those community events. Um, so that's hugely, we think that's a hugely important driver for the edge. And also, of course, where it is on the coast, uh, next to the water, the whole water sports and water leisure side of it is hugely important to us as well. Um, whether it's canoeing, whether it's swimming, <clears throat> whether it's paddle boarding, um, again, that's a, a huge driver to bring people to the coast, to teach people about the coast um, and for us to be proud of the coast. And as I say, for the building to very much interact and promote the water and that coast. Um, okay, thanks Tom, next slide. Um, so what are we trying to do? Well, we want to be um, the Villamore of the, Villamore of the North. And I know we're in Cumbria and you're going to have to imagine the sun and you're going to have to imagine the warmth. But what we're trying to get at here is um, we want the harbour to be very much a hub, very much an active hub, um, the beating heart of the town. And when you come in the weekend during the summer, we want events to be going on. We want things to be happening again, whether that's pop up performance, whatever it may be. Um, and we're working very much with all the food and beverage and the businesses around the harbour to try and bring this to life. Um, but we want things to happen. It's very much a blank canvas. Um, and anyone that wants to do anything or put displays or anything or do any performance around there, we very much want to work with people to make sure we've got a stage programme, a proper programme, a full programme, um, going throughout the year if possible, but starting with a, um, hopefully a packed summer if we possibly can. Um, so as I say, that's a blank canvas. That's what we want to try and do. And we want to make it a destination for people to come and enjoy. Um, and as I say, you just need to bring your imagination with you um, to make it happen. OK, thanks, Tom. Uh, as I say, that's just um, a to touch on events. Um, these pictures are from the Maritime Festival, which people probably remember, um, where 200,000 people descend on Whitehaven for a weekend. We're not saying we're going to bring the Maritime Festival back uh, by any means, but what we want to do is bring um, a series of big events back to Whitehaven uh, and spread again, as I said, through the summer rather than just having one massive weekend. We want to spread a number of big events, um, as I say, over a period of time through, um, through the summer. And this is probably a five year project in the making. We're just taking small steps now. As I say, we just want to put on a series of small events for now, test the water, bring people back into Whitehaven, as I say, build up in five years time to staging. Events possibly of the magnitude of the maritime. I'm saying, as I say, I want to make it clear we're not bringing the maritime back, um, but hopefully we'll see some perhaps big music events in the future. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, and as I say, it's all for us. It's about sustainable betterment. I've talked about us being not for profit, um, a real challenge for us to generate those revenues to make sure that we're putting back into the facilities and the infrastructure. And so we're very much reaching out to local businesses uh, and local partners to help us help us achieve that. Okay, thanks, Tom. So the room story, we haven't talked about the room story so far. The room story is a fantastic uh, exhibition, tourist attraction, museum, and um, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's on set on three stories, um, if you haven't been before. Um, it's where the old Jefferson building was. It is still on the property uh, that the Jeffersons ran in Whitehaven for so many years. And it tells the story of, um, of rum, um, not just in Whitehaven, but across the globe as well. And it tells some very important stories um, around how rum was produced uh, in Whitehaven. Um, first bottle produced in 1785. Um, Jefferson's rum is still made to this day. And I'll come on to that at the end of the presentation. Um, so the rum story is open in the year 2000. As I say, it tells a critical story um, of rum in Whitehaven. It tells the history of Whitehaven. Um, the rum story had to close through the pandemic um, for 16 months and we um, were actually, the board were actually considering mothballing it and shutting it down um, certainly for a, for, for a period of time um, beyond that um, because again, getting it to, to make money, it needed a lot of money spending on it. Fortunately, we were able to achieve a heritage lottery grant earlier this year, um, which enabled us to reopen um, having done a lot of maintenance behind the scenes um, at the end of June. I think it is a great experience, um, but it is 21 years old. It is the same as it was then, i.e. nothing new has been brought into the uh, exhibition since uh, the year 2000. Um, and before we opened, we thought to ourselves, because this does tell the story of the enslaved as well, part of the exhibition tells the story of um, the enslaved, 
um, within that whole story of Whitehaven and the rum trade. Um, that we needed to tell that story in a different way. It felt a little bit uncomfortable revisiting it um, in terms of telling the tale uh, to a modern audience in a relevant way. Uh, sorry, Tom, if you want to go on to the next, next slide. And, and, and you see some pictures here, top, top left in particular, bottom right, um, about that enslaved story. Um, we use quite a lot of storyboards and there's a little bit of sound. Uh, and then obviously the use of mannequins, as you can see here, to try and depict that story. Um, it's not modern, it's, it, it, and it's, it, it's not really that immersive. Um, and it's almost um, told from a, a middle-aged white person's perspective. And we wanted to bring different voices to that. So um, we reached out to Janet Walker and her team at Anti-Racist Cumbria and said, look, we need some help here. Um, we know we've got some challenges. We need to improve this. We need to tell this in a different way. Um, Janet and her team came and she brought three of her team to experience the rum story for the first time. Um, and Janet actually said um, if she hadn't been working, she'd have walked out because um, she found it extremely uncomfortable uh, and upsetting. Um, however, the great thing about Janet is that um, she saw it as a challenge. And the feedback we got from Janet was very much not just about the enslaved, but the whole exhibition. Um, lots of ideas around the whole customer journey, um, which was great to hear. Um, but we do need to change. We do need to make, um, make a difference. But again, we go back to the challenges of, well, we don't have a great deal of funding to enable us to do this. Um, so the great thing, again, about Janet and working with Anti-Racist Cumbria, um, they're very passionate, they get very involved. But also, and Janet will say this, um, we have a duty to tell the story in the correct way that's relevant for a modern audience. We have a duty to society to do that. Um, but also, and Janet will say this herself, um, it is actually, you've got to see it as an opportunity as well, because um, getting this right and doing this in the right way um, reaches a broader audience for you, reaches a wider audience for you. It gets more footfall for you. And it also opens up more funding opportunities for you by working alongside anti-racist Cumbria. Um, I'm sorry, Tom, if you could go on to the next slide. Um, so our work with ARC um, took us also into, into a direction of celebrating Black History Month, um, where we pulled together a number of um, Black people who've uh, done some great things across Cumbria. And we talked about their stories and gave their stories throughout the month of October. Um, and when we did that, um, we probably were a little bit uh, naive about the reaction that we thought we would get. Um, and you have to, if you're going to do these things, you have to be open to the fact that, you know, as a, as a county, we're at 2% um, of our population is um, of black colour. Um, and that's a real challenge. And the comments that we got and the feedback that we got was very strong and very scary uh, in terms of what we were doing and the feedback that we got. Um, but we know it's the right thing to do. Janet and her team are very passionate. They're great to work with. Um, they're doing some great stuff. The exhibition was incredibly popular. We got some great footfall through to, to the rum story and we're working, continuing to work with Janet and her team um, to try and make some sort of very, very small difference if we possibly can and improve and retell um, that story uh, that is so important to tell. Uh, okay, thanks, Tom. Um, and yeah, again, um, using that as, a, as an example of the exhibition space that we have in the rum story, um, again, a bit of a blank canvas, a great space. It feels like you're out in the open, but obviously it's covered. And you can see Emma Hunt there uh, on the right-hand side. Emma did um, an exhibition, photographic exhibition, art exhibition in the Rum Story for two months this year, which again was very popular um, and um, got some great feedback. So um, we're very much working to try and make the courtyard a real space for not just exhibitions, but events uh, and also the vault, um, which is also within the Rum Story. Um, which as it says is a, is, a, is a space which is great for dinners, great for conferences, great for parties, great for christenings, etc. Um, which as it says is a vault um, where we used to store the barrels for the room. Okay, thanks Tom. Uh, I've probably rattled on uh, for plenty of time enough. So just to finish, remember Christmas is coming. Um, we also have a shop, a retail shop on Lowther Street, um, which is connected to the room story. Um, the room story shop um, only sells local products sourced in Cumbria. Um, that is a, a USP that we've tried to drive through the shop this year. And of course, we sell the Jefferson's rum. It's brilliant for Christmas hampers. Um, so make sure you log on and get your Christmas gifts soon. Uh, 
thanks so much for listening. Uh, that's enough from me, I think. Uh, I'll hand back to Tom, but uh, thank you. And any questions, um, I'd be delighted. But thanks very much for the opportunity. We, we do allow a few pl plugs, John. It's OK. Uh, you, you got away with it. Um, I'm conscious of time, but it's, so if I can ask you to sort of be succinct in your answers here, John. Um, question from uh, Stefan, I think. Strong and scary feedback is what you said, John, there. Could you say a little more about this? Yes, yeah, so to, to, to sum up, we thought we were doing um, doing some some really good things with this. Um, we thought we'd tell you stories about um, black people in Cumbria. In Cumbria. Um, we got a lot of feedback around, well, well, why? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you celebrating white people in Cumbria? Um, this is ridiculous. Um, this is um, whitewashing, whatever. We got some really, um, really difficult feedback that we, uh, that, that's really, that's on face value, really hurt us and you could take really personally. Um, so um, you've got to see through that and, and realise that you're doing the right thing and that you're doing the right thing for the right reasons for the business as well as um, for the town and the community and for the county as a whole. Um, but to do it, you've got to be prepared for some some really, really harsh feedback that really, you know, you struggle to think that that happens and still exists in, in society. Really. OK, um, just on more, on more pr practical stuff, um, John, Fliss says, does the marina rent vary with their business, i.e. if they get more boats, do you get more to cover the increased footfall? Uh, so yes, we get a very small um, percentage of their um, turnover of their profit um, annually, um, and a very small rent, which if we could rewrite the contract would be very, very different. Um, so yeah, it's within our interest that we, we get um, more boats into, into the marina. Um, but in terms of, as I said, that's included when I talked about the 235 versus 315, that marina rent is included within that 235. That doesn't actually flex that much, although at 88% occupancy, um, you're probably looking at something like three or four grand difference to us. It doesn't okay. make a difference we'd like it to. Okay. And Derek's just observing about the central shopping area of Whitehaven seems to have deteriorated sharply. Does your initiative hold out hope of its restoration? Yes, I think um, I think the town really needs to decide what it wants to be. I think we need to accept that high, high street retail. Um, in terms of having major names at Whitehaven is gone, but there is some obviously some great architecture um, and some great local shops to go to in Whitehaven. I do think the town needs to focus on that and say, look, we're great for a local shopping centre and um, with some quirky shops, some USP shops, rather than think that we need to get big retailers back. Um, and, and the shop owners ourselves included need to also step up the game as well. Um, it's not just Whitehaven Town Council, it's not just Copeland Borough that need to do this. We need to help ourselves as well. Uh, and I think the challenge for me at Whitehaven is Whitehaven tends not to promote and market itself as a whole or get together as a whole. It tends to, you know, the big will do their thing, the rum store will do their thing, the individual shops will do their thing. We need to get together as a town and promote ourselves as a town because it can be fantastic. It's really, really exciting if we can get it, get okay. it right. But I think it does need to focus on those that local shopping experience, that quirky shopping experience, rather than think it's anything that it used to be in the past. All right, John, there's still more comments and questions in chat, so do feel free to look at those. Um, it's great to hear about Whitehaven. And I think on the Simon Reeve programme that some of you may have seen on Sunday night, the lakes, I think in this episode this week, Whitehaven might make an appearance. Uh, the inimitable Gerard Richardson, I understand, might be in it. But um, anyway, uh, so look out for that. Great pro programme, by the way, Simon Reeve. Um, really interesting take on Cumbria beyond just the sort of um, the nice stuff of the Lake District, I thought, when I saw it. So, John, thank you so much, John Baker. John, if you want to put your contacts into chat, that would also be useful. because People might well want to pick up with you after today. Thank you so much indeed. Right, Kate, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, and thank you, John. That was so interesting and, and so brave. Thank you. Um, yes, next we're going to Tully House Museum. Um, and I'd like to introduce Claire Slate Tome, who is assistant curator there. And she is going to talk about the Source Project, which is an artist development project uh, run by Cumbria Museum Consortium, the thing that I manage, um, as well as Signal Film and Media. So Claire, over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what Source is. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you for uh, letting me come on. Um, hello, I, as I say, I'm Claire. I'm the 
um, assistant curator um, at, at Tully House. And I'm also the uh, Tully project lead for, for, the, for the source project. Um, so I'm really keen to come along and, and talk about this project. It's one that I feel uh, very passionate about. And we have a celebration um, event for Source um, that you may be interested in, in coming along to sort of next Thursday afternoon. So essentially, it's a showcase of the artists who are involved in the Source project in 2020 and 2021. So to uh, bring you up to speed, um, Source was a divid digital development lab for emerging and early career artists to work uh, with museums to create work. Um, inspired by the collections of the participating organisations. So, and they were the Cumbria Museum Consortium Museums of Lakeland Art Steamboat Museum, um, Tully House, uh, Wordsworth Grasmere, um, along with Signal uh, Film and Media. And there was an open call and seven artists were selected to be involved in the development lab and to receive training and mentorship to be able to sort of add digital skills and sort of digital in general to their practice. And really the event is uh, bringing um, all of these artists together, um, as you can imagine during COVID, that, that wasn't uh, possible an awful lot of times. Um, so bring the artists together along with their work to kind of share um, with each other and, and, and the public the, the amazing work that, that they managed to achieve. So, um, for me, they are so deserving of this opportunity to kind of celebrate their achievements. I mean, they have been working all the way um, through the pandemic with media they're not familiar with and kind of trying to work with museums who are very much, I guess the USP for museums is about, you know, the real things. And obviously with COVID, they weren't necessarily able to connect in, in the way that we would would have liked with, with this kind of real um, collections. And, but despite that, we've emerged out of the other side with some really high quality and varied and quite thought provoking work. Indeed, um, Claire, it's, I think it's exactly that. It's the variety and the quality mm -hmm. um, that is really exciting. We have seven yes. artists, many are many of whom, in fact, most of whom are of this parish in terms of being yes. members of the Cumbria Arts and Culture Network. Um, uh, not least our very own Danielle, who yes. will be there next Thursday. So we're just going to play a little bit of uh, Jen McMillan's film, yeah, to give people okay. flavour. So hold fire whilst Tom goes ahead with that. I am the silhouette behind the lives I ripen, the lives I incubate, encapsulate, trap within my structure, the prison bars of my hands, the prison I bars of prehistory, before documentation, before witness, hand axe dating to 10,000 BC, now over documented, I endure collected and condensed. A part of me has been rescued from the west coast of North Cumbria, but I am everywhere. The flint of arrowheads and knives, the pottery and rock and art. I am Bronze Age, metalwork from axe and spearheads to gold and jewellery. I am Roman, I am Tess. To Hadrian's Wall and the Thanks. So that's just a tiny flavour of Jen McMillan's uh, digital piece that she uh, has created in response to the collections at Tully House. Yes. Um, that's right, absolutely. And just tell people how they can get hold of a ticket to come to the free uh, showcase event at Tully House next week on the 25th of November in the afternoon. How can okay, they I have a slide if, if, if Tom would, would, would oblige me, please. Here it is back again. So uh, there's a link here at the bottom, which is now in chat uh, for people to be able to book a ticket and come along and join us. And we would really love to see as many people as possible to celebrate the work of the seven artists, uh, two of whom worked at Tully House, Eleanor Cheney and Jen McMillan. Uh, yeah, anything else you want to add there, Claire? Um, I, I can 
all of the links have been added in the chat. Also, if you're not able to come along to join us, we are also going to be doing an Instagram live of some of the um, um, talks. So if you want to um, follow Tully House, then you will get a notification to join us live. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be there next Thursday in the chair and it would be great to see other CACN members to celebrate the work of the seven artists included. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Back to you, Tom. Great, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Claire. Looks fantastic. Really huge achievement to get that through the pandemic and in the, in the way and shape it is now. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. I said we go to Keswick and Desire Lines, and that's exactly what we're going to do, although we're going to do it via Nottingham, because that's where Rebecca Beinart with her sunshine is waiting for us. Uh, she was the person that pulled this project together, and it was a big effort by lots of people. Um, I was in Keswick Museum last week and actually picked up a leaflet um, of, uh, of the exhibition and the film that goes with it, but I know far less about it than Rebecca does, so I'm going to hand over the airwaves to Rebecca and we've got one or two slides to share with you as well. So Rebecca, if you'd like to introduce yourself while I get your slides ready. Thanks so much, Tom. So hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Baynert. I'm, I'm based in Nottingham, I'm an artist um, and I've been working on this project in Keswick over the best part of the last two years. Um, as Tom gets the kind of first slide up, I'm actually gonna pass straight over to Jesse Bins from the National Trust to just give you a tiny bit of background as to how this project came about. Um, then I will do a whistle stop tour through the whole process of making this project and there's a lot of people on this call who collaborated with me on the project so I'm hoping there'll be time for them to chip in at the end um, and for questions so we're going to try really hard to stick to time. Um, so over to you Jessie. Hello everyone, <laughs> can you all hear me okay? Yes. Uh, okay great, thanks Tom. So um, we we put the the brief together for this project back in the summer of 2019 which feels slightly like a different world now but um in that at that time the national trust was already shifting to uh, a way of working more with the communities who live and work in and around the places that we hold in trust for the nation um and it was kind of sparked uh, a little bit by the fact that in 2020 we were coming up to uh, the 125th anniversary of the foundation of the National Trust as an independent charity to look after places of natural beauty and historic interest for the benefit of everybody who lives in this country. And we were sparked by uh, the records when we looked at Brandle Howe Park, which was the first place in the Lake District to be protected uh, for the nation um, in 1902. And when that happened, all the shops in Keswick closed for half a day to join in the celebrations. And we were really reflecting on whether as a team we thought that would happen these days. And uh, we came to the conclusion that it probably wouldn't and that we needed probably to do something about that. Um, uh, it was really good for us because also Arts Council England were really in kind of pushing the National Trust to branch out from the work that we've been doing with them over the previous 10 years, where we'd done a lot of work working with artists who'd installed amazing things inside mansion houses. Um, but they were really encouraging us to um, do more stuff outdoors and to do um, to work with artists who work in a kind of socially engaged way and that kind of social practice. So it was a really new departure for the National Trust. It was quite hard for some of the senior managers to get their heads around uh, working in this way when we didn't know what the final outcome would be. Um, we were really lucky to have um, the kind of expertise of people uh, like, like Cathy Newbury to help kind of translate that and make that uh, Kind of understandable for a big kind of monolithic organization like the National Trust and just a little introduction uh, introduction to Crow Park um, sorry, for those sorry. Who... can we do next slide please <laughs> thank you oh, thanks, um, for those of you who don't know it it's a little parkland uh, right kind of sandwiched between the edge of the town and the edge of the lake um, it's like a little green buffer zone. It came, it was given to the National Trust in 1925, partly as a way of protecting that green space for the people in Keswick. And it is that kind of closest access to the lakeshore for people who, who live and work in Keswick. 
Um, it used to be an ancient woodland until it, all the trees were felled in the 18th century, um, which revealed this incredible view down the lake, which is partly responsible for kind of uh, sparking that picturesque movement of those very exaggerated uh, uh, kind of illustrations of views down, down the Lake District. Um, but it also sparked what uh, our National Trust curator claims could be the first ever in written environmental protest in the English language um, in the diary of Thomas Gray, where he lamented the fact that all the trees had been had been taken away. So it's a really interesting place where it's got this history of this incredible view, the history of tourism, and you know potentially our curator calls it a ground zero for the global conservation movement. So we were really interested in working with this place. Um, and we did an open call, we shortlisted four artists and we involved members of the local community in the selection process. And Rebecca was a clear favourite um, and I'll hand over to her to let her tell you what we actually did. Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> so can we have the next slide, please, Tom? So um, the commission asked for a socially engaged artist, as Jesse has said, to work with the National Trust team to test out different creative ways of engaging with people around Crow Park, to build new relationships and to devise a creative programme for the site that would involve and inspire people but leave no trace on the landscape. For me, coming to Cumbria as an outsider, the starting point was to listen to local people's stories and experiences of Crow Park. The Lake District has such a weight of cultural history. It's an amazing inheritance, but it also felt like this project needed to be about understanding the place from the ground up and sharing perspectives that weren't already known. I was also really interested in the way that focusing on a very specific place like this could be a tangible way into talking about much bigger questions, including conservation, climate change, ecology, and land access. One of the things that I was excited about coming into this project, but that was also a challenge, was to keep the process genuinely open so outcomes would be generated by the work that we did with people. I didn't know what we would end up making together, but I needed to carry the National Trust and everyone involved along on that journey. I was very lucky that Jesse and everyone I met through the project was so open-minded and we were able to build up enough trust to take risks in the creative process, which is definitely not something that is that easy for an organisation like the National Trust. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk through that creative journey that was hugely collaborative. As with everything in the past two years, the project has been disrupted by the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about the ways that we adapted to the situation as it unfolded. So in the first part of 2020, I began a process of walking, listening and mapping on Crow Park. I met lots of different people in Keswick, from National Trust rangers who've looked after this landscape for decades, to a sheep farmer, children from the local primary school, local residents, dog walkers, a passionate geologist who's here today, um, and a local councillor. I invited people to draw me a map like it was the back of an envelope and show me their version of Crow Park, landmarks and stories that were significant to them. We learned that Crow Park has many names, and in fact, not everyone knows it's called Crow Park. <laughs> um, and for some people, it's a centre, but for many, for many people, it's also an in-between place. Next slide, please. So, sorry, Livy, but this is, the, this is the experience of the weather on Crow Park. <laughs> um, uh, so I walked with many different people, and whilst we were walking, I recorded our conversations. As lockdowns hit, and it became clear that we needed different ways to keep the project alive, we decided to try making a series of podcasts from these audio recordings that were gathered on site. At this point, it was when I was introduced to R.L. Wilson, or Bob, who's also on the call, and thanks to Kathy Newbury and Andrew Deacon for that um, introduction. So we worked together using the audio recordings to create a series of podcasts that were released in 2021. And they are kind of audio collages that bring together different voices from the project around themes that were coming up in conversations. Um, and Jesse will share a link to the podcast where you can listen to them. So next slide, please. The title Desire Lines came from many different conversations about lines of movement through the landscape and the idea of lines of imagination that take us on, um, that travel through time. In an early conversation with Roy, who's uh, here as a head ranger from the National Trust, 
I learned that the line of the path on Crow Park followed the curve of the flotsam left from the lake flooding. Next slide, please. I, I worked with choreographer and movement artist Simone Kenyon to devise a series of movement workshops, exploring different ways to engage with the landscape through sensory experience. We were also thinking about ways to notice and pay attention to other than human entities in the landscape. This image shows a workshop with pupils from St Herbert's Primary School in September 2020, listening and looking, tracing their own movements and those of animals, birds, wind and weather. Next slide, please. Back at school, we did a mark making workshop, translating sound and movement into abstract pattern. This led to a series of designs that went on to inspire visual design for the Design Lines project. Next slide, please. I started to experiment with making fabric pieces that could act as flags or banners, picnic bl blankets or ponchos using outdoor fabric offcuts and the patterns that have come from the workshops. I was thinking about the materiality of this place. Keswick and the fells are awash with brightly coloured outdoor gear. As we went back into lockdowns in autumn, winter 2020, we started to think through ways of continuing the momentum of the project remotely. I used the pattern design and sensory explorations from the workshops to create a series of postcards for self-guided activities on Crow Park, and we tested these out in October half term. Next slide, please. Over the winter, I worked with Cumbria-based artist and writer Wallace Hine, who's also here today, um, to develop themes for an online talk and a series of creative writing workshops. We invited artist and poet Maya Chowdhury to join us for a conversation that delved into some of the themes emerging from the project, asking, does viewing the natural world through human eyes limit our understanding? How can we imagine beyond linear time and human viewpoints? And what could we learn from these different perspectives? Next slide, please. In spring 2021, Wallace and I ran a series of online creative writing workshops with a group of adults that extended ways of imagining with and from the landscape and generating new narratives. Through a series of exercises and prompts, participants explored future archaeologies of Crow Park, imagined eating the landscape, found portals into parallel worlds and tried writing a crow. I'll let um, Wallace explain that one. The outcomes of these sessions were some really remarkable pieces of creative writing. And when we were able to work in person again, I took these writing prompts out onto Crow Park with young people, including a group from Theatre by the Lake, which are in this picture here, and the Keswick Explorer Scouts. Next slide, please. From May to August, we installed the exchange post on Crow Park, a visual display to share updates from the project and a free leaflet that contains self-guided activities and a place to post back responses. Next slide, please. So this summer, as we moved towards the culmination of the project, I was thinking of ways to draw together the different threads from Desire Lines. I ran a workshop with the Scouts, playing further with costume ideas. We played with headpieces, hoods and body extensions, looking at folk traditions and discussing how costumes can create characters and how cloaked figures bring to mind superheroes, myths or ritual. Back at the start of the project, I'd imagined a mass participation event or performance on Crow Park, bringing together lots of people. Given the circumstances, we decided that making a film was more realistic, enabling us to work with a small group of people, but share the outcome with a larger audience. Although um, Bob may regret that decision. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So drawing from the Waltz workshop stories and designs, I started to sketch up a series of characters and costumes based on entities from the landscape. Some of these were forces of nature, water, weather, geology, and others were more specific or came from stories created during workshops, animal, plant, and insect. And of course, there had to be a crow. Next slide, please. The next phase of the project happened with speed and intensity and was hugely and joyfully collaborative. I did a call out to find someone to work with me to create the costumes and was very lucky to meet Maggie Tone Edgar, who's here today, um, an amazing designer and maker. I also met Viri Sitcher, who works in the Keswick Outfit Repair Shop and is incredibly talented at working with tricky outdoor fabrics. So the three of us worked together between Nottingham and Keswick using donated old tents, raincoats, and even a paraglider to create the costumes. 
Next slide, please. In July, we worked with seven amazing community performers, all locally based people who'd been involved in the project in some way. We had a weekend of improvisation and filming and Simone came back to work with the performers to develop movement. And they all brought their own interests and ideas to the characters' actions. So Rock is played by geologist Livy. Um, water is keen swimmer Monique. Weather is comedy genius Jack. Jordan, who's a National Trust ranger, found an affinity with the plant. And young performer George studied his budgies for bird-like head movements. Next slide, please. Um, um, Bob um, worked with Lawrence Campbell on the videography for the film and the wonderful Jesse and National Trust volunteers supported the production and Lexi Ward, who we'd met through Theatre by the Lake, assisted and took photographs. The final piece of the puzzle, oh, um, just as I go through, if you go through the next sort of three slides, Tom, as I'm speaking, that'd be great. The final piece of the puzzle was weaving through, weaving together a script that created a voiceover for, for the film. This used excerpts from the writing workshops to create a poetic narrative that was read by Jordan Tweddle and that's intersected by a more factual analytical voice read by Gillian Sholey. And thanks to Stefan for the introduction to Jordan. Bob then undertook the mammoth task of editing the film. So kind of two days worth of filming down to a 15 minute film, um, obviously with some interference from me and created the brilliant sound design for the film as well. So if you get the chance to listen to it, please do listen through good speakers if you can. Okay, and finally, we released the film at the Keswick Alhambra Cinema in October with a red carpet, drinks and snacks inspired by the Eating the Landscape workshop and made by local caterers. The film's now available to watch online and is on display along with the costumes at Keswick Museum until the 5th of December and Jessie's sharing some links there. Um, and if you just go on to the final slide, that's the links there. Okay, so that's it from me. And um, so hopefully we've got a couple of minutes left and I wanted to just, as well as obviously welcoming any questions, um, just open up for any of those people who collaborated on the project to chip in at this point, if you'd like to. Libby, Bob, anyone, how was it for you? Some great pictures on, on those slides there. Looks like fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, the acting took two days um, and they were very long days, but I think we all had fun doing it. And the costumes were so great to wear as well. Um, like you could really like flow with them. Um, I felt inspired by the other actors as well. Monique's got me into swimming. <laughs> And open water, which I never thought I'd end up doing. So it, it was really, it was really inspiring just to be a part of it, let alone see the outcomes as well. Um, definitely go see the costumes in real life in Keswick Museum because there's so much detail that you don't get to appreciate with the film. The film is amazing, but there's so many little things that like Maggie and Viri were doing and Rebecca as well with the, with the designs and everything. There's so much layers of thought that have gone into it with like the different directions of the um, symbols that were on the the big tent ponchos and stuff so it kind of like fits in with the character it gives you something to think about so channeling, you channeling your inner rock as you say yes. <laughs> and I think the picture that Rebecca shared of me is my best worst photo is so funny <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love it and hate it so much. It's so great. Jessie, <laughs> it's like, Jessie, that couldn't be any worse, but it's so funny. It has to be. <laughs> Jessie, can I ask you, you know, from a National Trust perspective, can you see the National Trust across Cumbria doing more of this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, I can. I think, you know, we're in a different reality now with funding, aren't we? You know, everybody's feeling that. But um, I think this approach of working more with communities is here to stay. Um, the National Trust has now changed my job title um, and my job description so that I am now a programming and partnerships officer so that it's, it's right in there with, and there are five of us across the Lake District looking to work in partnership with all kinds of different organizations, including um, creatives to, to try and, and work like this. So I, I think there'll be more. I just lost your last word there, but I think it was more. More, more. <laughs> okay, great. Lovely. 
Uh, and Rebecca, you know, um, it must have been quite a, you know, like herding herding cats at stages. It must have, you know, during, with the challenge of the pandemic as well. Um, you know, it must have been difficult to do it sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been really challenging. I mean, you know, I obviously kind of showed you everything that did happen, but not everything that didn't happen. <laughs> so there was lots of, um, I'm sure that we've all experienced this over the last, those, uh, last few years, kind of lots of having to reinvent Felt like reinventing the wheel um you know there are methods and ways of working that I would normally use with people that weren't possible to do so yeah. I think that the online events we did were the first online events the National Trust has ever done so that was quite a big one um and um but you know I think that the collaborative aspect you know which is something that is just the way that I work and I know I can't I don't have the skills to do everything you know I I don't know how to make a film um for example so I I really I really thrive on collaboration and on working with other people and I think that um, in a way that's kind of building a community around the project both sort of the wider community of everyone involved but also that all the different creative people involved was something that actually I feel like brought us all it kind of um, was very nourishing. And so is that one of the measures of success of the project to kind of use a you know a sort of quantitative term you know is it was it the community participation that was one of your measures of success? Yes, yeah, so I mean the kind of I would guess like some of the key aims of the project were involving communities in a creative process around that landscape. Um, so that is something that you know in the evaluation that's what we're looking at and looking at the feedback and the experience that people had. Um, I think the aspect of collaborating directly with a lot of other locally based creatives wasn't kind of written into the project. That's an approach that I brought and um, it's probably worth flagging up that I also was really um, it, you know, it, luckily for me, the project had a, a relatively good budget, and so I was able to pay everybody that we work with. And for me, that's kind of really important, um, you know, aspect of of this kind of work is that you're not expecting people to kind of give their labour for free. For sure. Yeah. Great. Well, look, lovely to see all the comments from people that both were involved directly and indirectly in chat. And congratulations to everybody on on making a really interesting thing happen. Lovely stuff and great to celebrate it on calls like this. Thank you. Thank you. All it's right, special. congratulations. And that film, as, as Rebecca said, it's it's on in Keswick Museum, just pop downstairs to the to the basement close to where the cafe is uh, and enjoy the film with a set of headphones on and there's some leaflets there too. Right, we're coming towards the end. Kate, Kate is our chair. Kate, some reflections from you. Um, what a great morning to hear from so many different people. Um, in the course of an hour is just great you, you know big contributions and tiny ones as well i think it really sums up what this network does which is to help people collaborate although clearly i don't take any credit for the work that rebecca's been doing uh, but i love the fact that there are so many people here who have had a hand in the projects talked about this morning and if not here then certainly it, within the wider network so that's all great what ambition and um uh, and, and quality, I think, to, to coin an Arts Council phrase, but also um, I'm really inspired by what John was saying earlier about the work that you're, you're doing and planning to do at the Rum Story. I think it's just so incredibly important and, and the reaction that you've had from some quarters only goes to reinforce how important it is. And I hope that you'll stay in touch with the network to tell us about how that's going, because it's something that means a lot to people here. So thank you for being brave enough to sort of share how it doesn't always go to plan. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. It's been it's been great to see everybody again, and thank you everybody for your contribution. All right, so thank you, Kate. Next week we've got Anna Chippendale, who is from Cumbria County Council, one of the cultural leads there. We're also going to hear about the Dorothy Wordsworth um, anniversary that the Kergate are coordinating in Cockermouth. There's a an interesting statue that is going to be revealed at the at the Cockermouth Christmas light switch on. On Sunday, by the way, I'm playing my ukulele as part of the cube on Sunday. If you want to come along and see me play my ukulele, no. uh, it's not it's not not just me. Uh, at the at the obviously it will be sunny and bright and warm on Sunday. Um, and also Alan Cleaver. Some of you may know Alan. He's a, he, he's a prolific writer and he's got a great book out about Christmas in the Lake District. So we're going to look at that uh, book with Alan as well. And by the way, December the seventeenth is going to be our Christmas. Uh, fandango shebang on this call so virtually through two through two dimensions we're going to have fun christmas fun on the 17th of december if you've got any ideas as to what we could do on that call please get in touch 
Um, the least that will be required will probably be a Christmas jumper or kind of some fairy lights. Or I think Libby did a great little um, display last year, if I remember correctly. So put that in your diary. December the 17th is going to be the Christmas call.